so that we are getting ready to start our next session, which is the first global networking forum session of today. And it is very much fitting that we are able to welcome now so many representatives of the academy, students filling up the room and getting interested to a session that is actually focusing on space in schools and the role of academy, which is really very fitting now. It is my pleasure to introduce the moderator of this session, the IEF president, Professor Pascal Ehrenfreund. Pascal, the word, is, the word is yours, and let me mention that Pascal is not only the president of the IEF, it is especially important to mention this at this session, that she is also the president of the International Space University, so as we are talking about academia and schools. Pascal, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Christian. So welcome uh, to this global uh, net f uh, networking forum, Space in Schools and the Role of Academia. Um, in the last years, we have, have observed really a very dynamically involving space economy. Uh, we have new emerging nations, we have commercial actors, we have a growing downstream sector, and um, also the non-space sector is strongly involved. We have discussed it during this conference. Um, but there is a significant shortage in the STEM workforce, so in particular in, the, in science and engineering uh, and uh, all the subjects which are really crucial uh, for the space ecosystem. So what we need when with this growing space economy in the future, we will need tens of thousands of highly skilled employees in the space sector, especially in the industry. Um, uh, in order to be responsible uh, for all those space endeavors we are planning right now. So um, educating the future space workforce uh, is pivotal. And uh, we want to discuss today uh, in this GNF uh, the role of school education but also academia. So school education is very important to start early, you know, to uh, get people and, 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 and young people interested in space, in the space sector, but of course also it's very important to uh, educate them right on the, on the, uh, in academia and universities all over the world. And interdisciplinary education is also something which is really crucial for the space sector. Um, and we have, I want to introduce um, uh, my distinguished panel members because they are coming partly from many different uh, backgrounds, uh, from school education, from academia, from organizations which are promoting uh, education. And uh, so, um, the first one beside me is Dominique Tillmans. She is the president of IRISI in Belgium. Uh, then we have Greg, maybe you uh, guys do so like this, yeah, Greg Kennedy, he's the Director of Collab uh, Collaboration and Concept Development, STEM School Highland Range in the US. Then we have Erasmo Carrero, Carrera, pardon, Professor of Aeronautics and Astronautics, Politecnico di Torino. And uh, then we have Gustavo Medina Tanco, he's the professor, Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> you switched. Oh, my God. Yeah, it's good to know. Yes, yes. actually, I have your photo, but not my glasses. Yeah. Um, uh, Gustav is uh, from the University, uh, Universidad Nacional Autonoma de Mexico. Good. Yeah. <laughs> then we have Armengol Torres, yeah? uh, Vice President of uh, Coordination and Education of the World Space Week Association. And uh, we have uh, Diego uh, Paul Sanchez Lana. He's a senior research associate at the University of Colorado Boulder. And I think you are a native uh, Ecuadorian, as I know. And um, uh, so we are going to start uh, a little bit uh, um, with discussing uh, with a statement uh, uh, of everybody, some uh, of our Panel members have slides, and I think we are opening with Dominique and uh, the slides. And for, before I want to say that, um, we are opening with uh, some kind of remarks of each of our distinguished panel members, and then you can ask questions. And um, you can see here on the screen that you can engage with the tool Slido. And for because we have such a full house and a lot of external participants today, uh, just to let you know, when you are using um, uh, Slido, you can ask questions. Uh, those questions will appear here 
and I will collect them and later on um, actually uh, ask the questions to the panel members. Yeah, did you notice? Thank you very much, and then we start with, the, uh, with uh, Dominique. Thank you, Pascal. Uh, please, can you launch the video of Switch to Space to introduce? Okay, thank you. you can already register. <laughs> so uh, Pascal, uh, this is the question, how to interest, to, how to attract students to study STEM and to make a career in space? This is the question. So we still have not the solution, but I will explain one experience, the experience of U-Space and it's even switched to space. Well, um, with switch to space, maybe um, you can be inspired or to better understand why students uh, do not plan to make a career in space. Uh, this concerns Belgium, but many countries, I'm sure, in, in Europe and certainly elsewhere as well. First, the, con the context. So I, I launched Switch to Space in 2014. So the context in 2014. The space sector in Europe employed about 40,000 people. In that time, the European Space Agency was faced to a wall. 35% of the employees were between 49 and 50 years old, the result of the baby boom of the 50s. It means the beginning of a long period, a long decade of retirement, and the need to recruit STEMs, but in numbers. It seems easy, but it wasn't, because uh, the 60s enthusiasm was not there anymore. So it was at the Belgium Senate at this time, uh, I, I chaired the, 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 space, uh, the Senate Space Group, and the industrials and the institutionals was there, and they asked me, to launch a reflection uh, about STEM in space and how to engage, uh, to interest uh, uh, young people in, in space. So we launched U-Space in 2014, and uh, U-Space is a platform to improve interaction between university students and, um, and, and, and the, 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 the space sector, the space professionals. So our goals, we have two goals engaging and informating students about space, and two, breaking the isolation of students by organizing networks between professionals and students. So we start, our first experience was uh, organizing face-to-face -face meetings. So I put the student in one side and the professional to the other side, face-to-face, -face, and the students has one minute to present themselves, 
When the professional is interested by the student, he raises the hand so they recognize themselves. So after all presentation by the students, uh, we, we share sandwich beers, success with the beers, we have the beer, and, um, and then networking. So uh, I make sure, I make sure. Huh? So the um, second experience, we decided, because it's difficult to contact the students, so we decide, we say, okay, difficult con to contact the students, we will go into the university. We have been into almo practically almost university in Belgium, and uh, with three specialists, one engineer, one uh, researcher, and one specialist in space application. Well, the experts had, has had tw uh, 20 minutes to explain their path, their job, um, the, the company where they work, and uh, the job vacancies. After the, uh, after the presentation, it's again sandwich, beers, and networking. And there, it was really interesting uh, to discuss with the students, and we was really astonished even in the last year of engineering, they don't plan to make a career in space. They don't think to space. And second, the students, then this is important, and it's, the students don't know the numerous domain in space. And it's normal. There is no information in the, given by the universities or given by the professionals. So they arrive at the university, they don't know the numerous domain of space. And a third, they ignore, they ignore the, 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 the numerous job, jobs uh, in space, like biology, medicine, agronomy, nutrition, biochemy, botany, climatology, geomatic, optic, uh, sism 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 sismology, and so on. There are many more, there are many others. So, with these uh, findings, we couldn't sit on our hands and we decided to launch Switch to Space in 2018. Um, it's a one-day event at the Egmont Palace in Brussels. It's the place where the European Commission organized its European Space uh, Conference. It's an historical palace and I've we thought, and I, I, and I thought, that it's very important to associate historical, uh, cultural heritage and science. So, it's one day event. In the morning, it's, the morning is devoted to a general overview of space, uh, about space, so it's ESA, European Commission, industry, and so. Then you have a lunch, and, during the, and we have a very good caterer, it's also important. And um, during the lunch, of course, it's networking, booth of the industrial, uh, from the industrial and so. And in the afternoon, we have seven topics. And in each topic, we have four, five presentations by space experts. And then, of course, we have question and answer. So we had, the, the first time, 50 speakers, so it's a lot. More than 450 students, Belgium is small, huh? but 450 50 students and all, uh, um, of, all, of all over the country and 90 space experts. So it's an event that we, we organized it that e uh, this event every two years because it's very heavy in, uh, to organize. And so in 2020, given the success and the enthusiasm from the students, from, from, the, from the professionals, we decided to launch Switch Space 2. Okay, in 2020, you know what's happening in 2020? It was the COVID. Hmm? So uh, we decided to launch it on, uh, on an hybrid format. And thanks to, to the hybrid format, we have 1,600 students all over the world registered. That it was a, a very big success. Today, we are preparing the third edition on the team Space Exploration Moon and Mars, you have seen. So save the date, it's accessible of course by Zoom. And uh, of course you can register. And so I just pass quickly the, 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 the slide. So it's diverse bag backgrounds, it's uh, various statues, of course. 
And this is the plenary you have seen on the, on the, um, on the video, the lunch. We, we will make a speed, speed dating and we have two walls. One, one wall with all the CVs of the students and one wall with all the, um, the, um, the job vacancies. Then, and then we have all the programs that you have seen um, and, and uh, on, the, on the video. And at the end, at the plenary, at the end, so we, we ask, before starting the each, to each topic, we ask a students to, to, to make a summary of the, of the topic. And uh, it must, a young one, it's not, it's, it must not be a professional. And uh, so at the, uh, after that, after the, the, sum, the, um, uh, the summarized, the, the, the summary of the, the topics, we, we, have, we have the chance this year to have the um, many astronauts who will be in Belgium uh, during the space weeks. So this is uh, our event. This is the, the, the room of the Palais des Gmont, and uh, it's the half of the, of the place. And this is my message to the, to, to the young people, to the, to the students, for their professional life, and even for their private life. Uh, it's important to, to go further and to be determined. So please make them, <laughs> please make so important. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dominique, also for introducing this initiative. Greg, um, we know you from uh, a lively presentations at the booth here beside us uh, near the chocolates here in the exhibition. Um, there is a significant shortage in the STEM workforce worldwide. We know that it's not only the space sector, it's, it's in general. But how can we succeed to increase the interest in uh, STEM subjects in schools already? Because we need to do it really early. Well, I want to start with saying, um, it's very important that you like me. It's very important that we build relationships. So that's where it starts. And um, just like me, uh, the younger students want to be liked. <laughs> and they want to be liked by you <laughs> and their teachers and all of space. So uh, the picture here is from Colorado. So I thought I would give you a piece of our aspen uh, trees uh, in Colorado that are changing. I know Lockheed Martin is a sponsor for this. I see it on the signs. And Lockheed Martin is very largely responsible for many of the things that I've been able to do in Colorado. This slide is something I learned from Lockheed Martin. So my high school students will work with Lockheed Martin a lot. The uh, engineers who built Lucy, my very good friend Sue Lynch who did the Goals satellites and uh, Mars 2020 heat shield and now the Janus and Trail Blazer projects. Numerous engineers, when they work with my students, they always start with this slide of themselves with lots of pictures so that my students right away um, realize that all of these people who build wonderful things are people. <laughs> and uh, and it, it starts with that relationship, so that's why I included that. What is the answer to this? I think the answer is simple, but not easy. The answer is to collaborate. And I want to urge everyone here to consider collaborating more than competition. In essence, even by waiting till students are at the university level before they're engaged in space is a competition. Think of how many students do not get to that level. How many students of infinite potential for your industry. And then if you engage with them when they're at the university level, they don't even know you're out there. They don't even know that they have a passion for what you do. So collaborate, 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 and do it at younger grades. You can start in kindergarten. I do a lot of work with middle school students and high school students, but please work together and don't make it a competition. And listen. Listen to the students. So many, I've been a teacher for 37 years and I can tell you that it's frustrating to be a teacher because institutions require you as a teacher to tell students what to do. And so students, listen to me, I'm a teacher. No, let's stop that. Let's start with us listening to the students. They have passions. 
They are people just like all of you, and we have to start with listening to them in the same way that I see you listen to each other. Then, by listening to those students and connecting them with professionals in the industries, you build those relationships and you empower these students and they become unstoppable forces in your industry. Um, so I don't know if this, uh, any videos will play for uh, what I included um, in this next slide. I see the blank slide and no videos. Is it possible to play one of those? If not, that's okay. Shall I fast forward to it? Uh, this slide has some videos of students. There's one, awesome. <laughs> Gabriele, uh, in the pink shirt. You have to see this. My job is very fun. I watch miracles all day long. And Gabriele is from Belize. In the fall of this year, Gabriele didn't know what aerospace was at all. And she was very, very shy. And in nine weeks' time, she had worked on the problem that none of you in here have solved. How do you go food on Mars? <laughs> and she presented at AIII's Ascent International Conference. And it was amazing. This is a little clip, and I want you to look for her passion. Oh, I can't play them from here. Well, we won't play them, that's fine. Um, visit me in the booth, and you will see what I mean. Um, by these miracles. Uh, another program you see, an all-girls team from Belize, the same thing. Um, Colorado School of Mines had told me that our student presentations from Belize and other countries we worked with rivaled the university presentations. After nine weeks, nine weeks of building relationships and trust and empowering students. I hope you sense my urgency in this. <laughs> So this is Gabriele, and again, I would ha be happy to play the video for you. Gabriele, after she was a um, participant on a team, How Do You Go Plants on Mars, she became what's called a legacy leader, peer-to-peer -peer empowering. So I work with uh, numerous industries, not just aerospace. GE Renewable is one industry I work with. And, and just a few weeks ago, we ended a, a global collaboration on um, a carbon-free grid of the future. And Gabriele went uh, into this adventure with her, with teams from Belize as a legacy mentor. So she was able to break down all the fear that the other students had. And so right away the students were engaged, they felt empowered because it wasn't an older authority telling them what to do. And I'll go really fast here. Uh, I would also like to uh, let you know that one of the, the challenges are teachers. And in the programs that we run, we're, we don't teach. The teachers facilitate. They facilitate a relationship, which includes project management, system thinking, RFPs, all the things that you all do that teachers are not taught to do. And, and so um, with the help of uh, all the teachers that have been through numerous pilots, we put together some best practices to help teachers make that transition. My lead mentor for my projects is Dr. Matula. She's amazing. She trains astronauts for NASA in Houston. And we also have mentors who have built the ISS and of course Lockheed Martin. But Dr. Matula has worked with me to develop a best practices for aerospace mentors. So I know a lot of industry people that say like, hey, you want me to work with students, I'm not sure what to do. <laughs> and so Dr. Matula has really helped with that. We do not want industry experts to make a lesson, design curriculum or classroom management. We want them to build a relationship and listen to students. And because you already know about what you do, it's amazing. You listen to their ideas and you're able to take that to a higher level for them just by a simple relationship. Almost done here, action items. I want everybody in this room to consider taking action on this now. Aerospace industry folks, these projects are scaling really fast and I need numerous mentors in different languages <laughs> for different countries. So please consider being a mentor. You can work with Dr. Matula and our other team of mentors and uh, so that you'll see it's as easy as showing up and listening. And then I have a couple projects for CubeSats 
and also uh, next fall's uh, Martian Greenhouse. In your own country, um, get a hold of me. Let's have a team from your country. I'm so thankful to Sita Rales. I'm so thankful to the students who are here today. I feel that Ecuador is a place that is ready for change. And they have strong opinion leaders who understand what to do. So I'm so happy for the future of Ecuador and so thankful. And um, so that's my presentation. I hope to engage with you and I hope you take action on this today. Thank you very much, Greg. And I just wanted to tell you that I have many, many, many questions on Slido. So uh, I have, have to keep going. Um, uh, uh, Gustavo Medina Tanco, uh, you um, are from Mexico, from a university. How interested are um, students in, this, uh, in the space sector and in Mexico? And how is the academic system in encouraging uh, the students uh, to be part of this new space generation? Well, n nice question, and let me tell you, I have the good luck of directing thesis from graduates and undergraduate students from Argentina, my country of origin, from Brazil, from Mexico, but also from US, Spain, France, Italy, Japan. And if that showed me something, is that we are rich in the emerging countries. We are rich because we are, we are, our students don't need inspiration, don't need motivation, they already have it. They need opportunities, yeah? and this is on to us. Yeah? This is the important thing and the important message. Yeah? So in that vein, let me show you a little bit what is our approach to solving that problem, to attacking that problem in Mexico, and that we are very happy to expand to every emerging country. The first thing is to make them study on concrete projects, hands-on, yeah? not exercises of laboratory, not toys. Yeah? For that, one important thing, and that is another message, is that we can start with international collaborations in science. We actually do as a, uh, use as a driver international collaborations, specifically in astroparticle physics and ultra-high energy cosmic rays, which is one of my areas of, of background. For that, we produce real instruments for science, frontier instruments in physics that are used in the stratosphere and space. We also do, of course, small engineering projects that in general are prepared in laboratory but are tested already in flight in the stratosphere. We fly at least once a month for that. We move into, na into nanosatellites, not because uh, nanosatellites are cool, yes, they are cool, of course, but because we have a vision of where we're going to go and we have a niche very well defined that for a country like Mexico is certainly precision agriculture and sustainability. And so we are focusing all our instrumentation into that direction and connecting companies for that. And for that, we do instrumentation that we test in the stratosphere, we are moving into space, we already launched our first satellites. Another line beyond LEO, thinking on the future now, at 10, 10 years, 15 years, we are developing, and this is another niche, micro-robotics for using in the moon. And I will show a little bit of that, and this, that implies not only engineering, but also basic sciences and frontier sciences, because we will go there to measure things that nobody has measured before. Using physics, and this is again something I, I want to transmit as a message for emerging countries, is extremely important for several things. First, it gives you a valid purpose, an objective valid purpose. Otherwise, I see we are making many times toys in a random fashion. Yeah? We just do a satellite here, another there, uh, one U, two U, three U, we don't know need why we want them, but we do it. But here you have valid purpose, it's objective valid, it is important, the science you will produce is frontier science, so you are also putting your, your country the vanguard. Another important thing is that you immediately fix standards of quality, because you are producing a subsystem that will be integrated in a larger international system. So the thing you are doing cannot be garbage. It has to be at the first level to be integrated that produce a robust instrument that may cost hundreds of millions of dollars, even if your contribution is small. The other important thing is that it fix a chronogram. Why a chronogram is important, especially in the academia? Because in the academia, we tend to know very well when our projects start, but not always when they will end or whether they will end. Yeah? But this is not good engineering. Yeah? 
So here you have a chronogram, you know when you have to deliver your product in time and quality. And this is extremely important. The other thing that I should highlight is that this gives the opportunity to four people in a way in which you have a two-way cooperation among equal partners. And this is extremely important. It is not the same to send a student somewhere to just receive unidirectionally knowledge, to put him in an environment where he will be unequal. He will have to discuss with other engineers, defend his positions. There are several feasible solutions for the same engineering problems, but there are solutions that we cannot pay, and another that we can pay, so we have to discuss, defend this position. This breaks a huge barrier, and it's a self-imposed barrier that our students tend to have in emerging countries. Now they know they can do it, and they are equal, and their opinions are respectable. This is self-respect. You cannot learn that in a book. Yeah? So you do this in experience. The other thing is that the, it is a nice, natural way to make know-how transfer. Because you have to discuss, to discuss interfaces. You have instruments, you have systems. When you do one of these subsystems, you have to know the other subsystems. Sometimes, then, you choose subsystems that are not beautiful because they are, you know, housekeeping systems. Because then you have interfaces with everybody. So you learn a lot. And it's cheap. Yeah? So you have to select wisely. And on the other hand, it also opens the doors to different kinds of funding from basic sciences and also from inter international environments. So I say, you can also use scientific international consortia as a trunk, and then on top of that, you can add your niches and start to develop your own technology with your own resources. Let me, very fast, to, to just to flash some things we do. We do a lot of uh, stratospheric ballooning, and we do it because of a good reason. Students have time scales that don't coincide with the time scales of large projects, and this is a problem. I have students that will be there for six months, one year, two years, three years. With stratospheric ballooning, they can have projects end-to-end from the, from the idea, the design, the procurement, production, qualification, integration, testing, flight, data recovery, with the advantage that you recover the payload, you discover the problems, what you did wrong, and you can launch again, and that at the budget that you can sustain, and with time that are compatible with students. Of course, we do large instruments also. This is a telescope for particle physics. It's stratospheric done under the coordination of NES. This is under the coordination of NASA with another partner. It's a 4.5 tons instrument. Uh, this is an instrument. This is another progression. This is a telecommunication instrument um, that we developed just our lab with CNES and was qualified. Another important thing, in all these collaborations, we make a point of making a significant contribution. Here in hardware, but you see, it is comparable to what other countries do. If we cannot do a significant contribution, we don't participate. It's not interesting because we are not a valuable partner. And this is important. This is, for example, well, ultraviolet camera for particle physics done with, with us at Roscosmos. This is an international space station. This is our first nanosatellite. Here, it's not only the satellite in which we tested all the subsystems. We launched this from, from India last year. And we done in the, was done in the middle of the pandemic. But it also has a partnership with a company uh, of U from US for, when, for whom we tested a new telecommunication antenna done with nanomaterials, for example. Uh, we have other instrumental uh, for physics that are being prepared or proposed to NASA. And of course, we have our mission to moon that I will just rapidly flash here mm -hmm. because really it is uh, nice. Uh, but this is a, a mission, sorry. How I cannot come. Okay, this is a mission that is the first of three other missions that we will send to the moon. We are developing micro robotics to use there with a new concept working in SWARM for scientific exploration, for mining and in situ research utilization prospection, and also eventually for commercial applications. So, this is a long term objective yeah, at 10, 12 years, and we, this is the first feasibility study, this will be together with astrobotic, language astrobotic in the moon soon. The important thing, all this is done by young people, yeah? many young people. Yeah? 250 students in the last five years, yeah? uh, 50 students at any time, 
from bachelors, masters, PhDs, all the engineers, many more than you have here, but also physics, astronomy, mathematics, statistics, also lawyers, artists, psychologists, everyone working in the same space, no walls in the labs. Yeah? They work sometimes even lawyers in topics of science, not only in law. Yeah? The thing is, everyone has something to apply. We don't care in this world that goes exponentially what they have studied. They are intelligent, they have a different view of the world, they can apply it and be useful. And this is basically the extension of this uh, laboratory that we are doing now. This is the, the building, this is a new laboratory, 1,000 square meter. The important thing of this is, this is the extension of this laboratory to a larger thing in which we will put together in the same space, government, academia, private initiative, also international collaboration from emerging countries, we would love to, uh, to do technology research, but also, and very importantly, we will help incubate companies, and we are already working with the Chambers of Industries companies, with the Secretary of Foreign Relations of Mexico, to move this forward and create this space, where basically, there will be all the facilities there to work in, obviously at our scale, we are not Alex Aleni or whatever, <laughs> yeah. but fundamentally we will create a space where people can know each other and then trigger technological interaction. Yeah. Also we will have our own projects, of course, but we will support external projects and we will receive visitors for using our own infrastructure, no cost. <laughs> Just come here, work together, create this pool of people that will push us together. Yeah? And of course, the part of startup is incubation. We will support young innovators and our students to do that, giving them co-working, technical infrastructure and sharing, but also we will create them a market. That is, our intention is pick up money from the government that traditionally go to incubate directly companies with not a, a nice rate of success, push this money, generate projects that have a social interest, for example, like uh, precision agriculture or things like that, and then with this money generate a market and standards mm -hmm. for these small companies. Because otherwise, in our countries, if you generate a small company with a very creative young people, it will be broken a year because nobody buys their product. Yeah? So this is the first step. Okay. Well, sorry okay. about taking that. And the other thing is, which is important for us, we not only <laughs> receive money from <laughs> institutions, we also have involved lots of companies. Actually, the last satellite we launched has no money from the government. It's all private. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> A lot of enthusiasm and possibilities for, for students. Thank you very much. Mr. Amangal Torres, um, uh, you are responsible also for events from the World Space Week Association. So your association actually tries to strengthen the link between space and society uh, through public education, dialogue, uh, events. Uh, what kind of activities do you support uh, and, and which audience uh, are you actually reaching with your activities? Thank you, Pascal. I am really honored to sharing this this panel here, and especially I, I'm feeling emotion because uh, looking at this particular audience with some, so many students, thank you for coming and thank you the organization for making this possible. This is not usual in, this, in these meetings. So, so let me um, uh, answer the question, uh, Pascal, uh, uh, describing uh, first which is uh, the origin of the World Specific Association. The World Specific Association uh, was uh, it's an initiative that was born in the UN OOSA. You know, it, this is the part of the United Nations organization that uh, relates with the outer space uh, subjects. And this uh, war was born with the idea of having uh, some kind of instrument for uh, developing during each year, only during uh, a, a weekend, you know, a week, um, the making making the the. the um, <coughs> making the world know the advantages of the, the use of the space technologies for the benefits of the humanity. So this is the idea. And why is this stony between the 4th of October and the, the 10th? In October 4th, if you can remember the history, in 1957 was when the first satellite in the history of the space, uh, uh, history in, in the world it was the Sputnik. And 10 years later, on the 10th of October, 
of the 67, the United Nations made the declaration of the use, uh, Pacific use of the, the outer space. So that's why uh, the origin of the, uh, the space uh, week is done between these days. So uh, why is the, which is the, <clears throat> the objectives of this kind of outreach and education um, uh, activities? The idea is to, to try to build some kind of bridge in between the, the offering and the needs that of the, is, is in the general public. And this great gap is in between who has the knowledge, who has the, the contents, who has the terabytes of uh, images that come every day from, from the, the observation satellites, and in the other hand, uh, we find the, the needs of the people that uh, can be benefited of all these uh, technologies applied in their daily daily needs. So th this kind of reach is what uh, the educators, especially the STEM specialists, we can we have the possibility to to solve uh, making this uh, more uh, possible for especially for the next generations. But apart of that, uh, let me show some of the the results. The last year, in fact, every year we, we choose a theme that uh, makes or, uh, the, the inspiration of the, uh, each World Space Week every year. Last year, the theme was the, the roles of the women in space. And you can see a specific poster that was generated for this theme with the several roles of this kind of girl, girls of women in the several uh, professions that can be found in the, in the space industry. And as it is to, is also, uh, despite the, we have the, have the pandemics, we reached more than 6,000 events, events that are uh, developed especially in schools, in, in universities, in uh, libraries, uh, in space uh, uh, museums, and, and whatever. And the majority are made spontaneously. You, you only need a, a, play, a, place, a space, you need uh, speakers, and a group of people interested and motivated for making some experiments and explaining the benefits of the, the space uh, systems and, and applications to, to the society. We are reaching almost 100 countries. In each country, we have a, some kind of uh, ambassador that is representing and is trying to, to help the, the organizer of events with ideas. Uh, we reach millions and millions of, of other uh, people uh, using the, the, the social media campaigns and channels we usually uh, use for, for disseminate these activities. And the results last year, you can see in the list, the top 10 best performers. You can see the majority are emerging countries. Uh, our colleagues have expressed it. They don't need um, to be motivated because in the emerging countries, people are, is already, are already motivated for making these kind of things. No? You can see the majority of, of them. And especially the countries that get, get uh, great results is because the uh, education ministries are deeply involved and committed in supporting the world specific celebration in their country. This is when this is best uh, is working in these in this countries, and you can see the results over here. So a part of that, let me explain. Uh, so first, you can see some of the more featured uh, activities that we uh, could, uh, was, that were developed last year when the involvement, involvement of uh, some uh, space agencies like the German DLR, uh, the STEM Alliance in Europe, and also with the participation of the U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris and the, uh, an astronaut, uh, a connection with the ISS, uh, uh, with the National Laboratory Office, and uh, the ISIRO, that is the great network of uh, space education for in, in Europe who are contributing every year for the development of these uh, activities. And uh, beyond of that, is not you cannot perhaps read because the the screen, uh, we, are, we were nominated for participating in the EIF uh, committees of space education and outreach committee, and also to participate in the committee on developing countries and emerging communities where we are uh, participating uh, with ideas and so on. And as the main results, you can see that the, uh, we, we detected that the activities were uh, highly appreciated. By, for, by the educators, especially for the participants, the, the students, with the great benefits because this uh, awakens the many vocations of STEM uh, that finally are going to, to, convert, to be converted in the workforce that uh, already today is a scarce, no? the, the talent 
uh, the companies, uh, many of them were expressed that they are, have difficulties to find these uh, specific uh, uh, profiles. You can see now the, that we have changed the, the theme this year is space and sustainability with the idea uh, uh, sustainability in the both ways, working with the space for uh, having the, uh, the developing sustainability in Earth and from Earth working for uh, accomplishing the sustainability in space as well. No? And of course we get the support of some uh, industrial uh, supporters because it's difficult to get as expressed uh, before, the support of uh, the public resources. But let me explain this case that this space uh, is a success case I, I detected. This is uh, a program that is named 2ME and 2MP, and this program was developed in Argentina starting in the year 2015. And you can see the great figures. The objective is to reach 2 million students along some years. They have already reached 1,300,000 students until now, starting with, uh, in the schools with nine years old and reaching also students uh, in, the, in the universities. The, the program involved in running six years about running uh, near 4,000 schools, uh, 12,000 teachers, and about 10,000 professionals involved in this plan. And which are the benefits? The benefits is uh, because all these million or near two million that has will reach at the end of the program, these students were using, uh, starting with the nine years old, particular uh, applications, the majority are of, of Earth observation, uh, that are installed already in the laptops that also were distributed by the, the Argentinian government. I remember that in 2015, uh, the internet didn't reach the, the schools uh, in that country yet. And the, the, the innovation is that they use the, the space technology and resources not for teaching space, but teaching the usual and current subjects in history, geography, physics, mathematics, and anything. So the idea is not to teach the science of space per se, but to teach the current uh, topics. For example, uh, this is a particular uh, case when uh, students uh, have to study the epic uh, the endeavor of the General San Martin when General San Martin crossed the, the Andes, you know, for liberating Chile and other uh, South American countries, he used to, to, to go different paths uh, crossing the, the Andes. And this is teaching, uh, this is history, using the resources of uh, Earth observation images of the same, I don't remember, I'm not sure if this was in winter or summer, I, I suppose was in winter, using the same uh, images and making calculations of the paths and the, the, the heights of the mountains or, or whatever. No? So the idea is to use uh, the, these um, resources for teaching the regular uh, subjects and at the end the, the country will have two million students that will uh, sooner or later uh, use the same uh, tools for the professional uh, applications in, in the future, not necessarily in, in space. Another success space was recently uh, was uh, this um, uh, space symposium Barcelona held uh, some weeks ago where uh, near half a hundred, uh, half a thousand attendees were discussing how we use uh, to, to teach uh, uh, space in the, in the universities in the last years. So more or less, this was, the, was what, what I wanted to, to explain today. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs> we have still two speakers and a lot of questions, I just want to tell you. Um, uh, Erasmo Carrera. You're a professor of aeronautics and, as, uh, and astronautics in Italy. So uh, it would be also important to look at the European point of view. In Europe, we have many universities that cover you know, individual disciplines of space research and engineering. And is this actually sufficient to educate the interdisciplinary workforce which we will need for the future space sector? Thank you, Pascal. Thank you for the question. So first, uh, I, I would uh, um, make a, um, you know, advert, uh, uh, to advertise the uh, Congress in Milano as, uh, um, uh, you know, we will have the most important Congress of uh, IIF in Milano in two, two years from now. And uh, this Congress is organized by the uh, bid made by uh, Italian Space Agency, Leonardo Company, and AIDA. 
AIDA is an Italian association mostly uh, of universities. And of course, this topic, we would like to continue to work on this topic also for Milan. So to have, uh, you know, this is uh, one of the key topic uh, of discussing uh, in Milan and we are working on this direction. So because it's extremely important as been said also in the other panels which were not focused on, uh, on academia and the education. The role of academia is extremely important. And of course, it's also nice to see students uh, this morning today because I skip, you know, I, uh, because I'm here, I had no lecture this week, so it's nice for me for a few minutes, you know, to see you all here. And uh, also nice for you because I have no to writing no equations, which is usually my work when I do lectures, so <laughs> don't worry. And, um, okay, let's go to the next. Okay, I will take, a, you know, I will talk to you a little bit more about Italy. It's a good example. And then, as uh, Pascal asked me to talk a little bit more in Europe. Yeah, what we are doing. Italy is, uh, you know, a very good example because we cover, as has been said by many other speakers uh, during these panels, covers all the, uh, the topics that uh, have been listed also by Dominique yeah, in, the, in, in this movie. Um, so we have everything, you know, from space sciences, uh, uh, robotics, uh, um, rover, landers, uh, in, in Torino, we have uh, uh, modules, uh, you know, managed modules, press rights modules. We are almost leaders in this. And um, we are active in so many uh, missions, scientific missions. Uh, so, for instance, one is OICLID. Uh, and, um, and, of course, in telecommunication, uh, we have uh, Copernicus, uh, uh, as uh, in, uh, in Italy, in the Valley of Fucino, which is very much close to this place here in Quito because the valley of, uh, of, uh, of Fucino was also an old lake. As this place is just 3,000 3, meters less, okay? <laughs> but this is the highest place we can have in Italy, you know, to put uh, 200 antennas there when we collect the data. So that's, you know, make everything uh, uh, very complex. So we need to have an educational system that is able to cover all this kind of uh, expertise they do require to us. You see the numbers here, we have uh, okay, many employees, uh, companies and research centers. Okay, yeah, the point is that you have to cover a gap. Yeah, we see the bridge. <laughs> yeah, yes, that's our point. You know, we never know, we will never cover all the gaps. We will always have uh, gaps to cover, you know, tomorrow. We hope we did our best uh, to, to cover the gaps of yesterday because industry really they need, uh, you know, from us uh, to make uh, people educated for, for their own needs. And of course, there is no other possibility. You have to work with them, no other chance. You have to work with the societies, with the industries. We have to make boards at the university level and to have people discussing continuously, uh, continuously, you cannot say I've done this and that's all. You have always to check it you have two or three times per year uh, with important panels, meetings and so on. That's, that's what you have to, to do. Okay, we see, uh, was just, you know, showing, I said, as example, Italy, just to, to, to go on something concrete. Yeah, Italy, as uh, you saw, the black, uh, points are places in which we have education in aerospace. So we have so many places, 30 universities that are involved in aerospace. We have 10,000 students, which is an army, yeah, right? So, and uh, uh, most of them, now we have 40% uh, in, uh, in, uh, in space. They are really very much passionate in space. Yeah, space is a passion, right? If you ask the students, why did you start to study space? Why? You know, when I came here uh, on, on Monday, the taxi driver asked me, what are you doing here in Quito? And then I said, I'm just, uh, you know, taking part of a conference on space. And then he said, what about ET? Are they really there waiting for us somewhere? So that's, you know, something is for common people. They are interested, you can imagine, students. When they come, you ask them, they have ideas. You know, that's nice. We try to talk to them why you did 
Uh, and they have some ideas. Sometimes the idea is really strange. If you had to put a mark on that idea, you could put zero, right? <laughs> because they are really no sense. But in many cases, they are very strong motivation. You know, they really have an idea and they have the passion to do. You know, so in Italy, you see this diagram here. We had really an increase, you know? This was really, you see the number in this uh, plot, I don't want to tell you. You see this diagram, then you have an increase. Why that? Yeah, that's the point. Because, you know, uh, we, uh, we started to work uh, on space exploration. The space exploration part starts once again, you know. We were talking about Artemis Gateway, and then to go to Mars, and to have people work, uh, living on the moon. And so the students were very excited by that. And so they say, why not to, to, you know, to play this game? And then they come and they start to study uh, aerospace. Yeah? You know, I, uh, as uh, Matthias told uh, uh, in the previous panel, that when he wanted to study space uh, in, uh, in here in uh, Ecuador, the space was not there. Okay? I remember when I, uh, I graduated in aeronautics, there was uh, only possibility to do space in Italy in two places. Rome and Torino, and the name of the school was only for postgraduate, so you had to do it already a master to start this. And the, in Torino and in Rome, there were the, these two schools, and I was one of the students, we are two students, one from Italy, myself, and the other one was from Brazil. Sorry for that. Okay, and now we have this new, new, uh, new team, space economy, space law, we had uh, already, uh, you know, on, on a workshop, uh, good, uh, good people making, you know, these uh, things uh, uh, running in the AIF, uh, Professor Marquisio, uh, Gabriela Rigo, they are working a lot. Space economy, you have started space economy in Italy courses this year, and uh, just something about European law level. You know, Europea, um, you probably are aware that in Europe we have this framework they, took, they take usually five, five years. In this framework, we do organize the research activities in Europe, and you have a lot of money. Usually, uh, for five years, can be 100 billion, so it's very huge. And in this framework, we do develop uh, calls, and we ask to people to make uh, you know, educational materials and to try to cover the gap. For instance, in the past call, the Copernicus, the use of the infrastructures you know, for improve the life of, of uh, uh, habitants of the, our planet. And this, this uh, just want to, 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 to tell this because uh, this point of a multidisciplinary here, to have people uh, working together from different fields is not easy. For instance, in the next call, which is continuation, in this, uh, if you go to the name of this project, you will find uh, internet website, materials available there, also easy to use, you know, uh, learning sessions. And they decide, for instance, to have only one call, because in the past event, uh, 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 they had uh, two projects funded, and they, one was for the upstream, and another one, first one, was for the downstream. Though they said, we want the people together, they just uh, funded one call for the next. So sorry for being longer, Pascal. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> A lot of helpful information. We would need certainly two hours for this topic. Uh, and now that uh, I come to the last uh, speaker, Diego Paul Sanchez Lana, I think you are from Ecuador, yeah? And you yes. are now in, uh, in, uh, in, um, in the University of, of Boulder, and you uh, uh, work on very interesting space missions, also asteroid sample return missions and so on. So how do you think uh, that we have to engage young professionals to be part of the space sector? And how do we motivate them? And how was your story, you know, coming from here to Boulder working on OSIRIS-REx? Well, can you hear me? Okay, thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank the conference. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me here. It's the first time in 20 years that I can actually come back to my country for a conference. Uh, I, yes, I am Ecuadorian. I was born here just a few minutes away from, from this place. I, I was a student of, at the uh, National Planetarium School. Actually, Dr. Lopez here, he was one of my teachers. Uh, and I'd like to thank him too. Um, maybe he was one of the first ones who, talked, who, who taught me something about space. Um, 
at the beginning when I was here as a student, I was not doing anything on, on things on space. Uh, I was doing research on computational quantum chemistry. Uh, when I started my PhD, I had to go to, to the UK, to the University of Nottingham. Um, and my research was about granular mechanics. Everything really has to do with, with grains and the movement of grains. After that, I did a postdoc in France, again about uh, granular mechanics. Then I, I actually started here to work at the National Secretariat of Science and Technology. Uh, maybe some of you know Dr. Eduard Jimenez. He was my boss. Um, that was about oh, 14 years ago. And then I was recruited to go to the University of Colorado Boulder to work on asteroids. Uh, at the beginning, I didn't really know anything about asteroids. Everything I knew was that they were just a special kind of granular matter. And well, since then, I've been involved in two space missions. One of them is the OSIRIS-REx mission, who is, which is going to bring back a sample from asteroid Bennu uh, next year, I think September. And there is another mission, the DART mission, which is going to test whether or not we can move an asteroid if at some point it's going to collide with Earth. Now, answering you, your question about um, how to engage young professionals, well, I, I really think the, the, the question has to be a bit wider than just young, young professionals. Everything you have been talking about here is not, is not just about the young professionals that have already chosen a career it's about the children, it's about their parents, it's about the larger society. Uh, and that is very important, and the reason for that is that if we do not engage the, large, the larger society, well, we will not be engaging the parents, the grandparents, the children. The, the, the parents of today, they are going to actually support their children to go into, in, into this kind of sector, in Ecuador spe specifically. <laughs> In, in countries in this region of, of South America, in, in, in which we do not really have a space tradition, um, the space sector seems really far away. It's a very risky place. It, it's, and, and that's because of a, of a few reasons. Um, of course, right now, we are connected. Internet is connecting everyone and everything in this planet. But even with that, when you try to think about a space, when you try to think about a career in a space, it's not going to be here, right? Because you know that if you, if you get a career in a space, you will not be able to come back, which means a few things. First, you will need to learn a new language, maybe two. You will need to get a visa. You will need to go to a different country. You will need to stay there for about a decade. Your family will stay behind. Your friends will stay behind. And if you finish your, 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 your studies, you get a master's, you get a PhD, you maybe get a postdoc, and maybe you get a position somewhere else, you will not be able to come back. Because there isn't a place for you. And that needs to change. How to do that? Well, by doing the things that you are, you are doing already in other countries. Academia really needs to reach out to everyone. We need to educate everyone. We need to open, as was announced here today, a space camps. We need to reach the children. We need to reach to the parents and the grandparents. We need to reach to the government too. I'm happy to see here today people from the, from the armed forces. Some of them actually could have been my colleagues some years ago because I was supposed to go to the Air Force. Um, I'm happy to see them here. I'm ha I'm, I, I was also happy to see here some people from the government. But even they cannot understand the things we do, because the things we do, let's face it, they are difficult to understand. It's technology and science at the edge of the things we know as, as, as humans. The things I, I, I try to understand might not really be useful for the next 100 years. Hopefully, they will not be useful in, in the next 100 years, because it has to do with planetary defense. But if we can reach every level of society, the new students, the students I can see here, and thank you for coming, they will know that we'll, they will not have to stay outside. They can do something here. If we reach to their parents, they will, they will be able to, to encourage their children. And because they are going to pay for those studies, they will be able to tell them, yes, it, it is possible. You will not have to leave home forever. You will be able to do something outside, yes, but you will be able to also come back here 
you will be able to do a life in your own country. You will be able to, to support the development of your own country. And when those children at some point have children too, they will be able to tell them, yeah, I did it. You can do it too. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was also a, a, a great story <laughs> from somebody who, uh, who comes from Ecuador. So we have a lot of questions, and I just wanted to make it very short. Um, uh, somebody asked uh, 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 about studies in, uh, of space law. We had a master class here, and we have Professor Sergio Marquisio here, and everybody here from the Secretariat at IAF can bring you in contact with him. He is around here to answer more about this question, because we had a, a session yesterday, and we had also a, a, a class on, Sunday, on, on Monday about that. And then there are several questions about um, do you agree uh, that space education is uh, 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 extremely relevant and important for, space eco uh, for a space ecosystem? And if you lack uh, it, can a space ecosystem actually survive, more or less? I think everybody of us, and I don't need to make a lightning round here in that, this is clear. Without space, e space education, you will have not we have no good working space ecosystem, and that's important for every country. And um, then there is uh, uh, one question. Uh, uh, if people which are teaching now uh, from the older generation, if they would be able actually to uh, prepare the, the workforce for the future uh, in the space sector. And I think that's a good question, but I think in many of those activities which we have seen today, we educate uh, the students and the teachers. Yeah? In many of those, uh, uh, Zero and all this, uh, also I think from the space, uh, 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 World Space Week and in all these uh, educations, um, uh, we also look that the teachers are motivated, educated, and carry this education then further. And you have a lot of school labs and so on. So this is, uh, uh, I think, an uh, important thing. And. Um, um, the, the, the question which was um, uh, asked and had the, had the most hits is, uh, as we see many students here today, what would be a, a your advice for them to success? And I give you everybody 20 seconds. And the, one, the bravest one starts. <laughs> Greg, is, Greg, is, Greg is always ready, yeah? Reach out to people. I absolutely uh, love what was said about um, be, being able to bring this to everybody, every child, every parent, every grandparent, all over. And that involves relationships, and not just relationships exclusive to some people. Relationships with everybody. We all should care about space. We all should care about each other. Thank you. Who else is brave? <laughs> Very short, self-confidence. That's it. Today, everything is possible. If you are 18 years old, 20 years old, the world is yours. Just believe in you, go ahead, and you will find the opportunities, even for funding, for money, whatever. Yes? Yeah. Believe in yourself, be determined, and please, have, you must have a vision in your life. You must say, well, I would like to, have, to arrive there. So when you have this vision, you will take all your decision to go in this way. If you have no vision, you will go like this, like this, and maybe you will, have no, will not arrive. So please have a vision. <laughs> Mr. Torres. Most of my advice is be loyal to your initial curiosity and go beyond your any, any limits that you, you, can, you, you can get in your, in your way. Erasmo? Yeah, I can tell you if you work with space people, they are the best in the world. So you <laughs> I think I'm the last one. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Diego? Yeah. Okay, my advice would be a, f a few things. Make a plan. The difference between a dream and a plan is that a plan has a date. You need to be specific about the things you want. You need to be specific about the things that need to be done. Second, be honest about yourself and be honest to others. Tell the truth all the time. You need to know where to go, but you need to be honest about everything you're doing in life, because otherwise, believe me, science, not, 
will not ever support or engage with liars. Be careful with the people you talk to. Take care of yourself. Remember your family. Remember your country. Remember where you come from. And do not forget who you are. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for listening to this panel. I thank really all the distinguished speakers. They are all available. There is a chocolate tasting now, but please don't run away. Um, uh, they are all available and they will be in between the chocolates. <laughs> thank you very much for, 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 for listening to this panel. Thanks a lot, Pascal, uh, for the moderation. It's obvious with so many students and young people in the room, this panel needed to have a bit more time. Thanks to all the speakers and please if you could come forward for the traditional group picture.